very good evening to all of our friends and welcome to the hindu news analysis of shankar ias academy for the date 3rd november 2020 the list of the news articles along with the page numbers of five different editions is given here for your reference also the handwritten notes in the pdf format and time stampings for all the news articles taken up for today's discussion is given in the description box and also in the comment section for the best interest of the viewers let us now begin our news analysis Now let us take up this op-ed article which is with reference to the poor nutrition status of school going children especially in the covid-19 period in this context let us try to understand how school going children are affected due to the covid-19 pandemic and we'll also see the important points mentioned in this op-ed the syllabus relevant for this analysis is highlighted here for your reference please go through it so far we have talked about how covid-19 affected the learning outcomes and how digital divide has played a decisive role in the education system and in the last week we have discussed about the annual status of education report which was released by an ngo called pratham and we saw how rural children are most affected due to this digital divide so today we will be seeing how covid-19 has been affecting the nutritional status of children yes we are talking about the mid day meal scheme or mdms through which the school going children are provided hot meals in their schools see it is the largest school feeding program in the world and it played an extremely significant role in increasing the nutrition and learning outcomes among the school going children but the school closures due to the covid-19 has impacted the mdms program see a midday meal provides 450 kilo calories of energy and approximately 1/3 of the nutritional requirements to all school going children from class 1 to class 8 in government and government aided schools however many research reports and even the joint review mission of mdms 2015-16 noted that many children reach schools with an empty stomach that is without breakfast making this school's midday meal a major source of nutrition for children particularly those from the vulnerable communities so this was the case until the arrival of covid-19 pandemic but after the arrival of the pandemic schools were the first institutions which were closed in order to protect children and in march and april 2020 in order to provide meals to children the government has announced that the usual hot cooked midday meal or an equivalent dry ration or grains would be provided to all eligible school going children even during vacation and this is to ensure that their immunity and nutrition is not compromised but even after many months states are still struggling to implement this now according to the food corporation of india's food grain bulletin the offtake of grains under mdms from fci during april and may 2020 was just 22% and this was lower than the corresponding offtake during the previous year that is april and may 2019 Around 23 states and union territories reported a decline in the grain offtake from FCI in April and May 2020 compared to the corresponding months in 2019. And to the extreme, Bihar haven't taken any food grain for MDMS during these two months in 2020. So this shows the poor implementation of MDMS during the COVID-19. And data and media reports indicate that dry ration distributions in place of school meals are irregular. Then the other worrying angle is that there are reports of children engaging in labor in order to supplement the fallen family incomes in vulnerable households. In July this year, the Madras High Court also took cognizance of this issue and asked the Tamil Nadu government to respond on how the nutritional needs of children were being fulfilled with schools closed. See, serving hot meals at the children's home or even at the center may have challenges in the present scenario. Even states like Tamil Nadu with a relatively good infrastructure for MDMS are unable to serve the mandated hot cooked meals during the lockdown. So what can be done to provide nutrition to school going children in current situation? See the experts suggest the involvement of local small holder farmers in school feeding. It is a livelihood model which links local small holder farmers with the midday meal system for the supply of cereals, vegetables and eggs while meeting protein and hidden hunger needs. And this could diversify the production of farming systems, transform the rural livelihoods and the local economy and it also fulfills the Atmanirbhar portion that is the nutritional self sufficiency agenda the covid-19 crisis has also brought home the need for such decentralized models and local supply chains there are also new initiatives such as the school nutrition kitchen garden which is under the midday meal scheme in order to provide fresh vegetables for midday meals besides ensuring that these are functional hot meals can also be provided to eligible children with a plan to prepare and distribute the meal in the school midday meal center and this is similar to the free urban canteens or community kitchens for elderly or others in distress in states like odisha here the author also stresses on the poor performance of our country in global hunger and nutrition reports in the global hunger index 2020 india ranked 94 out of 107 countries and we were in the category serious behind our neighbors pakistan bangladesh and nepal the index is a combination of indicators of undernutrition in population and uh, wasting stunting and mortality in children below 5 years of age so we are already far out in terms of achieving the zero hunger goal and in the absence of urgent measures to address the hunger problem 
the situation will only worsen. See the global hunger index is jointly published by Concern Worldwide and World Hunger Life. And even the report of the state of food security and nutrition in the world 2020 painted a worrying picture. A real-time monitoring tool estimated that as of April 2020, during the peak of school closures, 369 children globally were losing out on school meals and a bulk of them were from India. See the SOFI 2020 report has been jointly prepared by the Food and Agriculture Organization, then International Fund for Agricultural Development, the UNICEF, World Food Programme and the World Health Organization. So the author says that across the country and the world, innovative learning methods are being adopted to ensure children's education outcomes. And with continuing uncertainty regarding the reopening of the schools, innovation is similarly required to ensure that not just food but nutrition is delivered regularly to millions of children of our nation. So this is all about this op-ed article. With this, we'll move on to the next news. Let us take up this editorial which is written by the former director of the National Council of Educational Research and Training or simply NCERT. In the editorial, the author focuses on some of the important issues associated with the National Education Policy 2020. So let us discuss the important points given in this editorial. The syllabus relevant for this analysis is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. So we all know that the center had replaced the National Education Policy of 1986 with the National Education Policy 2020. And to know more about the silent features of the National Education Policy 2020, refer to our 3rd August Hindu News Analysis. Now coming to the editorial, the author is concerned with the federal courtesy or attitude which was observed by the center in the National Education Policy 2020. Now let us see why. See the draft National Education Policy of 2019 had provided for regulatory structure at both center and the state levels. And at the state level, it envisaged a state school regulatory authority. But the National Education Policy of 2020 provides only for a state school standards authority and not a regulatory authority at the state level. And this move was criticized as centralization of regulatory powers and the intrusion of center into the state sphere. The author says that both the 1986 and 2020 policies failed to completely acknowledge the variety prevailing in provincial educational practices. Here, the author is not in favor of assuming that the national system will evolve and iron out the provincial variations. So how did the education system evolve in the provinces? Know that the Government of India Act of 1919 decided to make education mainly a provincial and transferred subject and to limit the control of the central government over a minimum. And accordingly, a Central Advisory Board of Education was set up in 1920 to serve as a discussion forum for coordinating regional responses to common issues. But things changed after the independence. Unlike some federal countries, India has a Ministry of Education at the center and education including technical education, medical education and universities comes under the concurrent list. So Ministry of Education's role is not just coordination among states but to articulate aims and standards to pave the road to nation building and development. So we can say that post-independence, center played a substantial role in education. Now coming to the 1986 policy, it emphasized on national perspective without specifically referring to diverging provincial practices. And during this period, the private sector began to push both public policy and popular perceptions of education. And the rapid expansion of urban middle class who could buy education prioritized private over public. Thus, education, traditionally a public responsibility, started to get privatized. And at present, India has three systems. The first is the central system with an exam board that has an all India reach through affiliation with English medium private schools. The author feels that they mainly serve the regional elites. The system also includes advanced professional institutes and universities. They have more access to greater per capita funding than those run by the states. And the second system is the state system. It also includes provincial secondary boards affiliating schools teaching in state languages. And the third system is purely based on private investment. This includes internationally accredited school boards and globally connected private universities. And according to the author, the coordination among the three systems has proved unmanageable. The author says that the new policy underestimates the problem of reconciling the three systems. It envisages functional uniformity that is nationally codified and uh, administered measures to transform educational institutions across India. But such a monolithic regulatory architecture or one-size-fits-all approach is unlikely to succeed. So what is the way forward? See the need of the hour is a reliable mechanism to reconcile the standards of different boards and universities. That is to iron out the issues and reconcile the three systems. We all know that with overall prosperity and uh, economic growth, social inequalities have become sharper. So our education system must evolve 
to mediate between different social strata divided on the lines of caste and economic status. So the best way is to minimize the difference in quality provided by the public and private institutions. In long term, this will also help us to achieve the aim set by right to education. And finally, we should have an education policy that has a systemic vision both for recovery from institutional decay and for a better future of our nation. So this is all about the discussion of this news article. With this, we'll move on to the next news. Now this editorial talks about the Cero survey and the issues and misinterpretations associated with it. Let us discuss them in detail. The relevant syllabus is given here for your reference. Please go through it. First, we need to understand about the Cero survey. See, Cero survey is the collection and testing of serum specimen or proxy fluids, which are alternative sample types. Serum is the clear yellowish liquid part of the blood that remains after the clotting of blood. And uh, alternative sample types used in the Cero survey include oral fluid, breast milk and blood collected from umbilical cords. Now in a Cero survey, the specimens from a defined population over a specified period of time is collected and tested. And this is to estimate the prevalence of antibodies against a specific infectious pathogen. See, an antibody is a protein produced by the body's immune system when it detects harmful substances called antigens. Antigens include microorganisms like bacteria and virus, etc. Each type of antibody is unique and it defends the body against one specific type of antigen. And in our case, it is the SARS-CoV-2. Thus, antibodies are an indicator of immunity to a specific antigen and the sero surveys estimate its prevalence. Also, a well-designed sero survey can provide information on the proportion of population which has sero protection and it can also provide information on the proportion of population which is susceptible, that is, the proportion of population which is non-immune. Here, sero protection means the detection of antibody above a postulated immune protective threshold which simply means that they have immunity to that pathogen or that particular proportion of population was already infected which is identified through the survey. So, sero surveys can be used to monitor immunity of the population over the time and also verify that whether infection elimination is sustained. Particularly in India, ICMR conducted the Cero survey and uh, its objective was to estimate the infection's national prevalence and also its spread in hotspots. But according to the author, we should be cautious while interpreting the results obtained through Cero surveys. First is because of the problems with the antibody tests. As we know, antibodies presence in the blood serum confirms past infection. But the SARS-CoV-2 virus carries several antigens and our body responds to all of them. Here, the main issue is that an antibody against each antigen has its own time of appearance and it has its own duration in the blood and on rate of decay over the time. So, according to a study, these antibodies levels decline over time in people with asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infections. This decline reduces to 50% of the initial levels of infection by about 36 days and it also becomes undetectable by 60 days after proven infection. Additionally, another issue is that the detection of antibodies does not correlate well with the protective virus neutralizing function of the immunity. Just producing antibody to the pathogen is not enough, rather it has to neutralize the pathogen or antigen. So according to the authors, in certain cases, the simple presence of antibodies did not mean that the virus has been neutralized. Hence, to confirm this, the virus neutralizing antibodies has to be tested. But it cannot be done as handling it is a risky job. Here, another study found that if two antibodies are detected, then the results correlate better with the neutralizing function. This leads to the third issue that is the available test kits use only one antigen. Next issue is that the inter-survey comparison is not possible with respect to India. It is because so far the ICMR has conducted two sero surveys and each time the antigen used for the survey were different. Second is the underestimation of prevalence of infection. The reason is the latent period between the infection and the appearance of a detectable antibody. See the latent period for COVID-19 is about 4 weeks. So the results of the sero survey pertain to a part of the study period only. For example, ICMR's first two survey was conducted from May 11 to June 4, but the results pertain predominantly to the antibody status of people from April 13 to May 7 only. And this was because the appearance of the detectable antibody takes 4 weeks to occur. So those who got infected after May 7 would have been blocked in the study. And especially the period of peak of infections may not have been covered in the survey due to this 4 weeks gap. Thus, it could have led to errors of gross underestimation of the prevalence of infection. Now, to rectify this error, the author suggests to include correction factors in the results. See, correction factor is a factor that is multiplied with the result of an equation in order to correct a non-amount of systematic error. So, what is the consequence of this misinterpretation of results? See, the consequence is that understanding the epidemic profile will be difficult. So, do we need to fear in case of India? 
See, the authors note that India has attained half of the required herd immunity level to end the pandemic by mid of September itself. Here, know that herd immunity is the indirect protection from a contagious infectious disease that happens when a population is immune. So, now we just need to follow the required norms to stop the spread of infection. For example, we know that the festival season is coming up. So, we have to celebrate the festivals by following strict norms. So, this is all about this editorial. With this, we'll move on to the next news. Now, have a look at this question. It is based on this news article which says that the Rajasthan government's order banning the use of firecrackers and also the notice issued by the National Green Tribunal asking the centre to consider banning the crackers in the national capital region is not good for the fireworks herb located in the state of Tamil Nadu. In this context, let us try to understand the chemistry behind fireworks. See, to produce the colourful patterns and shapes, fireworks utilise a precise chemical mixture that's going to burn at the right temperature and at the right time. And this requires four main chemical ingredients, which include an oxidizer, a fuel, a colorant and a binder. And as we know, fireworks need a plenty of oxygen to facilitate the burn. And this is where the oxidizers come in. An oxidizer is pretty much what it sounds like, that is a chemical rich in oxygen. See, oxidizer release excess oxygen to make a better explosion. The most commonly used oxidizers are nitrates, chlorates and perchlorates. The next one is the fuel. See, the fuel source in fireworks is typically a charcoal based black powder or sulfur. The fuel combines with the oxygen released by the oxidizer, setting the stage for an explosion when fire is added. And these chemicals used for the fuel and the oxidizer are almost the same ones found in the standard gunpowder. And know that the fuse used to light the tiny rocket is made from very fine gunpowder. The burning fuse then lights much larger granulations of the gunpowder at the bottom of the firework. And that explosion carries the rocket into the sky. Finally, pellets of gunpowder are packed in the firework's body. These capsules are what ultimately force the firework to burst apart. And these pellets have colorant and the binder within them. See, the colorant chemicals help determine the different colors we see. The binder, often a type of uh, starch called dextrin, binds the fuel, oxidizer and the colorant together within the pellets. When the packets explode, the chemical elements emit light and the colorant produces very specific wavelengths that can be seen by the naked eyes. So it is very clear that fireworks emit large quantity of chemicals in the atmosphere and it damages health and environment alike. For example, extensive burning of firecrackers during festivals such as Diwali is a significant source of aerosols, black carbon, nitrogen and sulfur dioxide and various other gases. And this results in short-term anthropogenic pollution which causes serious health hazards. For example, barium salts are used in the firecrackers in order to get green color. But they emit poisonous gas which causes respiratory problem and also long-term exposure results in other health complications. So in 2018, the Supreme Court banned the use of barium salts. So what is the solution? See, a solution to this problem is green crackers also called as improved firecrackers. See, they have reduced shell size compared to the conventional firecrackers. And they also eliminate the use of ash and also their use is believed to reduce emissions of uh, particulate matter such as sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. Now see this question. Consider the following statements. Nitrates, chlorates and perchlorates are the commonly used oxidizers in conventional firecrackers because of their ability to produce oxygen. Yes, this statement is correct. And the second statement reads, green crackers eliminates ash usage, uses dust suppressants and reduces the particulate matter emission by at least 30%. Yes, this statement is also correct. So both statement 1 and 2 are correct. Here we are supposed to identify the correct statement or statements. So the correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. With this, we'll move on to the next news. Now have a look at this question. It is based on this news article which says that the attorney general declined consent to initiate contempt proceedings against Andhra Pradesh Chief Minister Jagan Mohan Reddy. But however, the Attorney General said that the timing itself for the Chief Minister's letter to the Chief Justice of India containing allegations against the Supreme Court Judge N. V. Ramana and the subsequent public release of the document could certainly said to be suspect. So in this context, let us have a brief discussion on Attorney General. See the Article 76 of Indian Constitution mentions Attorney General, his appointment, his duties, etc. As you can see, the Attorney General is appointed by the President of India and he should be qualified to be appointed as a Judge of the Supreme Court. Here know that a person to be appointed as a Judge of the Supreme Court, first he or she should be a citizen of India and has been a High Court Judge for 5 years or an advocate in the High Court for at least 10 years or a distinguished jurist in the opinion of the President. And Article 76 further states that the Attorney General has to give advice to the Government of India upon such legal matters and to perform such other duties of a legal character as may from time to time be referred to him by the President of India. 
and also to discharge the functions conferred on him under the constitution or any other law for the time being in force. And in performance of these duties, the Attorney General will have right of audience in all courts in India. In addition, Article 76 also mentions that the Attorney General shall hold office during the pleasure of the President and he or she shall receive such remuneration as determined by the President. It means the constitution does not guarantee security of tenure to the Attorney General and can be removed from the office according to the whims and fancies of the President. In addition, according to Article 88 of Indian Constitution, the Attorney General has the right to speak in and to take part in the proceedings of either House of the Parliament or in any joint sitting of the Houses. The Attorney General can also take part in any committee of the Parliament of which he is named as a member. Importantly, know that here, Attorney General will not enjoy the right to vote when he takes part in any parliamentary proceeding, including in any parliamentary committee. And according to the Law Officers Rules 1987, the term of a Law Officer is 3 years and is eligible for reappointment as well. Here, Law Officers include the Attorney General, Solicitor General and Assistant Solicitor General. Now coming to the duties of a Law Officer, they are to give advice to the Government of India in legal matters, to appear in the Supreme Court or in any High Court on the behalf of the Government in cases in which the Government is a party or is interested. Then finally, to represent the Government of India in any reference made by the President to the Supreme Court under Article 143 of the Indian Constitution. And these rules also impose certain restrictions on the law officers like they should not defend an accused person in a criminal prosecution without the permission of the Government of India and they should not accept appointment to any office in any company or corporation without the permission of the Government of India. And finally, they should not advise or hold a brief against the Government of India. So this is all about Attorney General. Now see this question, consider the following statements with reference to Attorney General of India. The first statement reads, the tenure of Attorney General is 3 years as defined by the Constitution of India. See this statement is wrong. Know that the Constitution does not guarantee security of tenure to Attorney General and he can be removed whenever the President wishes. And the term of a law officer is 3 years according to the Law Officer Rules of 1987. So the first statement is incorrect. Now the second statement reads, Attorney General has the right to speak in and to take part in the proceedings of either House of the Parliament. Yes, this statement is correct. But remember he or she does not have the right to vote. So the second statement is correct and we have to identify the incorrect statement or statements from these given statements. So the correct answer is option A, one only. With this we will move on to the practice questions discussion section based on today's news analysis. Now see this question, consider the following statements with reference to herd immunity. The first statement is wrong. A herd immunity is the indirect protection from a contagious infectious disease that happens when a population is immune. The immunity could be achieved either through vaccination or it can be developed through previous infection that is natural herd immunity. So statement 1 is incorrect because it is an indirect protection and uh, it states that only through vaccination the protection could be achieved. This statement is incorrect. So this means that even people who are not vaccinated or in whom the vaccine doesn't trigger immunity immunity are protected because people around them who are immune can act as buffers between them and an infected person. So the concept of herd immunity is generally used for calculating how many people will need to be vaccinated in a population in order to protect those who are not vaccinated. Now the second statement reads, a disease can eventually be eliminated if once herd immunity has been established for a while along with curbing the ability of the disease to spread. Yes, this statement is correct. Know that once herd immunity has been established for a while along with curbing the ability of the disease to spread, then the disease can be eventually eliminated. For example, this is how the word eradicated the disease called smallpox. So statement 2 is correct and statement 1 is incorrect. We have to identify the correct statement or statements. So the correct answer is option B, 2 only. Now have a look at these mains practice questions. Please write your answers and post it in the comment section. Our feedback will be given in a reasonable time frame. So friends, with this we have come to the end of analysis of all the news articles taken up for today's discussion and also the discussion of practice questions. If you like this video, please press the like button, comment, share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service preparation.